welcome to Courageous and Just Conversations on Faith in Challenging Times. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union in New York City. And it is a privilege to be here today with Dr. Jeremy Cruz, Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at St. John's University, also here in New York City. But to say that Dr. Cruz is Professor of Religion and Theology at St. John's University doesn't begin to address just the significance of the work that you do and how in fact you see yourself as a theologian and a person of faith. You describe yourself as a practitioner of moral advocacy. Yeah. Tell me about that. I think the language of practitioner, maybe I just prefer it to scholar activist. I don't, maybe I don't like the word activist mm -hmm. as much. And I guess um, I like to think of myself as, I'm not, I'm not just teaching ethics, I'm trying to, to live it out. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm practicing, I'm a practitioner, I'm a practicing ethicist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the reason I'm maybe a little bit allergic to the word activist yeah. is that it implies that everyone else is, uh, you know, we don't call them inactivists. <laughs> right. And we're all active, we're all doing stuff. And the question is really, what are we doing? And what impacts is it having? And so um, I want to encourage all of us, and I'm a practitioner, but we're all practitioners. We all mm -hmm. have a practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no good. And I was going to ask you uh, why you were allergic to that word, <laughs> activist. But what I'm really intrigued by is that you say we're all doing something. And what's interesting to me about that is that people, even in their silence, don't recognize how they are actually acting in such a way, either uh, acting in service of justice or not. Say something about that. Would you agree with that? I think I would. I mean, I think there's such a thing as uh, silence that is prophetic or that communicates without words, but at the same time, silence is often complicity. It's moral That's complicity. Exactly right. Uh, Martin Luther King always spoke of that, right? That uh, the moral complicity uh, or the immoral complicity uh, found in one's silence. Let's talk a little bit more about this practitioner part and where your more moral advocacy has led you. And in fact, uh, very important issues that oftentimes get lost in our discourse. And these are the issues and the concerns of farm workers. Yeah, through, through my work at St. John's as a professor, I try to connect with myself and connect my students with um, various organizations. One of the primary ones is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. They usually speak with my students at least once a semester. Mm -hmm. um, we'll speak with me more times a semester about kind of what's going on in the classroom. Um, and uh, so they're based in Florida. I also connect with the campaign, a farm worker campaign here mm -hmm. in New York. Um, the uh, uh, Justice for Farm Workers campaign mm -hmm. that's a little bit of a different campaign. So there's kind of two campaigns currently that I try to connect with and connect my students with and um, do some things that are church-based as well. I know that there are bills before Congress that uh, impact uh, farm workers and of which you have some particular concern. A lot of people don't know that in the 1930s when we got a lot of our uh, labor laws in this country as part of the New Deal, that two groups, um, two main groups were exempted. They were treated as exceptions to these labor laws. And we talk about labor laws, we're talking about things like the eight hour workday, 40 hour work week, paid overtime, you know, uh, later, you know, things like workers' compensation, child labor laws, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, farm workers and domestic workers were right. exempted from both of those. And the primary reason they were exempted were they were the um, children and some of them actually people themselves uh, uh, who had been uh, enslaved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're about one generation removed from slavery. Um, these were sectors that primarily African-American people were doing that labor, mm -hmm. domestic and agricultural labor. And so, you know, as part of the, you know, the, the negotiating in, in the Congress to get um, labor laws passed, these two groups were exempted. Mm -hmm. And we're still living with those exemptions today. Farm workers and domestic workers, um, there's, there's been an, an uptick um, uh, here in New York, for example, of uh, domestic workers organizing. They got a domestic workers bill of rights. Mm -hmm. 
that's an attempt on the state level to deal with this national problem. And so you've got different states trying to handle it on the state level because we don't have the political will to handle it at the national level. Right. So these two campaigns that I work on, the, the New York campaign uh, is an attempt to amend the New York State Constitution. The Justice for Farm Workers campaign tries to, is, is seeking to amend the state constitution to give farm workers equal labor rights, uh, the same labor rights that other workers have. Uh, the campaign in Florida, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, they currently, uh, they've found some success and they're operating in a different political context in Florida. And so um, they're trying to respond at the level of the market and leveraging market power and market mm -hmm. pressure to um, solve some of the problems that farm workers face, whether it's poverty or being sprayed with pesticides or rampant sexual assault in the fields or um, you know workplace injuries, child labor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they're using boycotts as a strategy mm -hmm. to put pressure on actors within the market to change their behaviors and agree to certain types of uh, contracts that um, change the situation without, um, uh, because we can't yet change it at the level of labor right. law. Most of us, this isn't what we, we think of, and, and we ought to, uh, when we think of the various issues even of pay equity and labor laws and uh, social justice. What drew you to this? Um, some of it was academic, some of it mm -hmm. felt like a calling, vocational. Um, academically, I've always been really interested in, in studying labor movements. Mm -hmm. I did a bachelor's in US history focused on the kind of period from the end of slavery through civil rights. And so different. I was interested in different social movements, labor movements, civil rights movements, uh, black freedom movements, et cetera. Um, when I was doing my MDiv, I had the opportunity to do a ministry practicum, and most people would um, do that in a hospital setting. Um, I uh, petitioned to instead um, do a summer, su summer internship with labor unions, and so I got training with Interfaith Worker Justice, mm -hmm. an interfaith organization based in Chicago. I got some community organizing training, and I was um, placed with a labor union and, and had the opportunity to accompany workers and participate in their efforts to secure um, labor rights. And so that kind of stoked and enlivened what um, the, uh, my interests in, in uh, labor issues even more and my connections to the work. Uh, but there's also a personal connection. I come from a farm worker family. My, um, my dad was born in a f agricultural labor camp. Um, so I, I grew up hearing stories of the camp right, and what it was right. like as a young child for him living in the camp. Where was he? In, in Orange County. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Orange County was called Orange County because it used to be all oranges. Was, and so yeah. they were, they were um, born into the camps in the, in the orange groves. You have a hard time finding, <laughs> finding oranges anymore in, in Orange County. But um, uh, that, uh, that's where my family come, uh, my dad's side of the family, that's where they come from. Yeah, you also say that there was an article that, or speech, actually it started out, it was a speech, now become an article, by uh, Cesar Chavez, yeah. uh, the Mexican, American, and the church that highly influenced you. And of course, Cesar Chavez was very engaged uh, and work with the poor, with uh, farmers, uh, labor work. So how has that influenced you? Through my graduate studies, I think reading the speeches of Cesar Chavez really fed, um, fed me personally, but also helped me kind of see a, a vision of um, faith and prayer life and a commitment to civic engagement and social transformation, really radical social transformation, to seeing those as inherently connected and, and indivisible. Mm -hmm. um, that particular speech that, that Chavez gave uh, was challenging Catholic church leaders, his own church. He was mm -hmm. speaking in a prophetic way about his own church, saying, we are struggling, and most of these farm workers are Catholic, and we're being accompanied by leaders from Protestant churches yeah. and from non-Christian religious traditions, and and there was a challenge. It was a kind of calling uh, calling to account Catholic leaders for not being committed enough, uh, for standing on the sidelines, or wanting to adopt a posture of um, neutrality, as if um, you know, to quote uh, um, Howard Zinn, as if being neutral, uh, as if you could be neutral on a moving train. Mm -hmm. And he's he's challenging the church to. Um, to live up to its 
ideals and to its story, to the Jesus story. What for you is the in essential uh, connection between your faith and your work uh, in terms of the labor movement? I, I think there are several links. Um, one, one that comes to mind is just that um, workers have inherent dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, workers are part of God's people. Yeah. Um, but on a deeper level, labor is so closely connected to love, which in the Christian tradition is what we understand ourselves. It's, it's not just that we are owed things because we have dignity. The, the purpose of our existence, the meaning of our existence is to love, and we love through the work that we do, the work we do in our homes, the work we do in our neighborhoods and communities, the work we do building up the common good. And so uh, to protect and promote dignified labor is to protect and promote everyone's um, space to participate in loving the world and bringing it to its fullness. So what does it mean when these institutions we call church don't do that? Are they still church? I'll leave it to God to decide whether they're <laughs> still church. I, I, I know they understand themselves to be church. I think that those who do church without participating in the work of the Spirit in renewing, liberating, recreating the world mm -hmm. are really missing out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say that. Um, I think that those who do church without participating in that work are missing out on fullness of life themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel tempted often to kind of shame or say, you know, this person or that person isn't living up to the standard, but I'm not living up to the standard. But um, I think what's important for us to recognize is how we're all being diminished by mm -hmm. our um, unwillingness or our fears or our avoidance of doing that work. I, doing this work has enlivened me. It has given so much to my life, and I try to share that, and I try to encourage people. It's, I want everybody to participate in it because it's a it's a gift that uh, it's a it's certainly a challenge and involves sacrifice, but it's also a gift, and I want people to be able to experience that gift. Not only are you a practitioner of moral advocacy in terms of labor rights and farm workers' uh, rights, but you have also been quite concerned uh, in terms of the struggle against uh, anti-black uh, racism and white supremacy and the relationships uh, between the uh, Latino, Latina communities and the black community, uh, the African-American community. And I was quite struck uh, and one of your pieces of trying to find, what, one of your essays of trying to find this as you talked about the in-between space uh, so where the two communities can come together as opposed to fighting against one another or at least not recognizing uh, the common ground and the solidarity. What, what's that in-between space look like? I think, I think a big part of the in-between space is us having conversations and knowing our shared history. Mm -hmm. We're robbed of our shared history. We're, we go through a process of a couple decades of miseducation <laughs> before, before some of us, a, a portion of us, even have a chance to maybe access some of it in college or, uh, if we're lucky, access some of it on Twitter or in yes, in these right. other spaces right. where it's usually not in college, right, right? Where 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 we learn our stories that are not being told in in That's right. authorized, sanctioned classroom spaces. So I, I think it starts there. Uh, but I think building that in between space to that the space that liminal space where new possibilities and new life is created. Um, I think it 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 happens in doing work that needs to be done together. And, and that work, you know, it might look like marching across bridges and boycotting and that kind of stuff, but it's also just sharing space and sharing meals and um, offering support uh, to one another. I think oftentimes in church spaces, I've experienced that 
the kind of call to dialogue is mm-hmm. often framed as um, the need to break down partisanship. Neither yeah. red nor the church isn't red nor blue; it's purple. And and I think that that often gives a kind of um, priority to dialogues that are really about dialogues between dominant competing factions within in our context in the United States. Um, you know, the, the way in which we commonly talk about the culture wars, for example. Right. And that doesn't actually speak to me about the kinds of relationship building and dialogues that, needed to be, that need to be created in order to create transformative social movements from the bottom up. Mm-hmm. Um, th- those kind of dialogues that are the sort of dialogues between red and blue um, don't often lead to the kinds of bottom-up social transformation that we're looking for. Can you speak to that a little bit, to, to talk more about white supremacy as opposed to anti-black racism, which is a part of that, but it's the white supremacist narrative that allows us to have this shared story that we often don't recognize. So yeah, sometimes right. I talk about anti-black racism or anti-brown racism or white supremacy or um, uh, white colonialism or settler colonialism. We, we need a lot of language and a lot of metaphors to be able to name it. But I think the point, you know, in a, in a theological framework would be that, you know, you can't love your neighbor if you can't even name, or you can't love your enemy if you can't even name it. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes the enemy is, is particular people and sometimes it's forces, you know, what, uh, powers and principalities, it's, it's systems and structures. And I think that the better we are able to name those, the better we are able to enter into the work of disrupting, resisting, Mm -hmm. transforming, and maybe when we've done that, getting to the place where some sort of unity or, or love can even take root in in these relationships in whatever emerges in place of these things that are causing death and destruction. Yeah. So it sounds like we find that solidarity in the common work that we're doing. Yeah, I think we we find that solidarity in the work and we find it in recognizing all the times that we've done it in the past but that we don't even know those stories. Mm-hmm. There there are there are stories of of heroic Deeds of victories of and of worthwhile defeats yep. that we've enjoyed together, mm-hmm. and I think that talking about talking about those moments also helps us do the work better because there are plenty of you know I, I talk about this in some of my writing. There's plenty of places, for example, in the past and in the present, where we can talk about non-black Latinos being experiencing racism and also being a complicit. Right in anti-black racism, both anti-black racism against black Latinos and against African Americans and other um, uh, black people of other um, nationalities and ethnicities. So um, I think doing the work and sharing that space creates opportunities Mm -hmm. for for seeing ourselves, um, seeing our own complicity better as well. Not just saying the problem is out there, but seeing ourselves as tangled up in these webs of, of violence. No, and I agree. And, and, and it's one of the shared stories we have, even in their particularities. And you articulated this colorism at some point in one of your essays. And I think that same thing exists, clearly, uh, in the African-American community and complicity in others' oppression and even in our own oppression and the way in which colorism plays out in the African-American community as well. Two last questions for you. You, you said something about loving your enemy and having to name it, to love it. What's loving your enemy look like? What's that mean? That's a hard question. I don't, I don't think that trying to love my enemy is the center of my work. Mm-hmm. I think what I'm more interested in is creating the conditions for the possibility of mm-hmm. that. That mm-hmm. is to say, I know that I can't love my enemy under the current circumstances. Mm -hmm. I I can't love my enemy who is actively destroying me and my loved ones. But if I can figure out how to alter the situation, Mm -hmm. create safety, create create the possibilities for transformation, Mm -hmm. something else can take hold that the the spirit may be able to make happen that I can't make happen on my own. 
Thank you for that. I often think of, uh, we talk about loving the enemy, that a part of loving your enemy is not letting them stay in this place of injustice and, and resisting the kind of injustice uh, which is perpetuated systemically, structurally, or otherwise, and even by uh, persons uh, individually. So that love and justice, for me, have to go together. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I do want to hold space for the possibility for people to change. Mm -hmm. I know that I have um, done harm mm -hmm. and that people I've done harm to have not written me off. And I want to leave room for the possibility of other people to change. The center of my community organizing, of my advocacy, is not trying to change oppressors' minds and hearts. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I want to live a life that leaves room for the possibility mm -hmm. that God is working with them too, and that at some point they're going to be in a space where they can actually make a positive contribution to um, the reign of God in the world rather than being an um, obstacle or disruption to it. So Jeremy, as you fight for a more just earth, on the many levels in which you do so, what's a just earth look like? I think it encompasses the entire community of life, not just humans, mm -hmm. but the entire community of life that is suffering, that it's being annihilated. Um, it's thinking about all of the webs of interdependence that we have. Um, and on the human level, it's about developing a kind of communities of safety and of mm -hmm. deep, deep, um, I would say demo I, I, democracy is the better, the best language I have for it, participation, um, where people are in control of their own labor. They're not born into debt. They're not born into inescapable rent traps. Yeah. They're not built, they're not living trapped by walls and cages, mm -hmm. these, these sophisticated mm -hmm. networks of walls and cages that um, so many people on the planet are contained by. Um, I think it would start there, and I, I guess then the work for me is to think about what can I do today, what can I do tomorrow to inch us toward that vision that I'm never going to see in my lifetime, but what's, how, how can I fail forward? <laughs>